Today we will finish our discussion of SM1 and start on our next topic, which is elimination reaction. Uh, last time we were talking about uh, this particular SM1 reaction, which involved a tertiary iodide, and the iodide gets replaced with methanol. <clears throat> Mechanism for this process, if you remember, SM1 is characterized by the presence of a carbocation, unlike SN2. So we're going to start by ionization of the carbon leaving group bond to make the carbocation. The carbocation has commonly three fates that we talked about, capture a nucleophile, be deprotonated, form a pi bond, and rearrange. The one that's going to be applicable here, since we're doing a substitution process, is capture a nucleophile. Methanol is the nucleophile. That gives us an oxonium ion, and because the nucleophile can be captured from either face, we're going to have a mixture of, of oxonium ions that are produced here. The major one is the one that comes from inversion, uh, attacking the backside of where the carbon leaving group bond was because of the iodide uh, having some steric hindrance with the carbocation. But then we finish our mechanism in this particular case with a deprotonation of the oxonium ion. To give that ether again a mixture with inversion being the major product and retention of the initial stereochemistry being a minor. We don't know what the ratio of these is. Maybe it's 99 to 1. Maybe it's 50.01 to 49.99. We're not sure, but inversion is the major one. Now, we were talking last time about, <clears throat> oh, I should also mention that this is the rate determining step. The energetically most expensive process, the one that has the highest energy of activation, so that is really the one that influences the rate. The other two steps are, are much, much faster <clears throat> than this ionization step. So when we talk about the rate, this is the step we're going to focus on. When we were talking about uh, variables and how they influence the rate, we talked about the nucleophile and came to the conclusion, what conclusion do we come to? If you change the nature of the nucleophile, what does that do to an SM1 reaction rate? Nothing, it's, uh, nucleophilicity is irrelevant because it's not, the carbocation capturing nucleophile is not in the rate determining step. <clears throat> we talked about the leaving group, that's certainly relevant, and said that making the leaving group better, better leaving group influences the rate. Well, because for exactly the same thing in an SN2 reaction, when the leaving group, the easier the leaving group is to depart, uh, the faster the reaction goes in that rate determining step. We talked about the nature of the things attached to the carbon. And in terms of the rate, we said that methyl leaving group, uh, primary leaving group, which is faster, methyl or primary in an SM1 reaction? Primary. Secondary being even faster and tertiary being the fastest of that entire set. <clears throat> and this is related not to steric hindrance, but rather to carbocation, CC, common abbreviation for carbocation, carbocation stability. The easier, the uh, more stable the carbocation is, the easier it is to make. And since some people have asked me where that comes from, in this transition state, that's the one that controls the rate of this process. The, car the, the carbon that used to have the leaving group is gaining positive charge. It's beginning to look like a carbocation. And depending upon how readily that transition state can handle that delta plus, that's going to influence the ease at which that transition state is achieved. So the easier the carbon, the better this carbon here to here can bear the positive charge, the easier it is to happen. It's like if you want a metaphor, you want a metaphor for a day? Imagine you're having a breakup, right, with your significant other. How many of you have done this recently? How many of you do it like every week? All right, so if you're having a breakup with your significant other and you don't feel really good by yourself, you're, it's not going to happen. You're kind of clingy, right? So if you're unstable on your own, 
then the breakup doesn't happen as easily. On the other hand, if you say to your, your significant other, you're not very significant, bye, I'm happy by myself, it's much easier to do the breakup. You know what I'm talking about? No? Okay. You'll, trust me, you'll learn. <coughs> All right, so the easier it is for this ionization to occur, either, either because the leaving group is better and or the carbocation is more stable, the reaction is faster. Now, there is one effect that we have not talked about yet, one variable we have not talked about, and that is solvent. And having just said about the nature of the ionization here, perhaps that makes solvent pretty clear. <clears throat> now, in SN2, we said that the, sol the preferred solvent really depends upon the nature of the reactants. If either or both of the reactants have charge in SN2, we prefer a solvent, <clears throat> excuse me, which is middle of the road polarity and apolar. That doesn't make sense. Middle of the road polarity and aprotic. Not enough copies. This will have to do. We're not. All right, solvent. <clears throat> so in an SM1 reaction, if we want to think about solvent, let's think about this rate determining step right here. That's our rate determining step. In our example reaction, it's the ionization of the carbon iodine bond. But in general, the SN1 rate determining step is this, ionization of the carbon leaving group bond to make a carbocation plus the leaving group, whatever it is. I can't put a charge on the leaving group because I don't know what it is. I'm being generic. I can put a charge on the carbocation. <clears throat> What's going on here is the bond is breaking. A covalent bond is going away. Something which used to be a covalent bond is now becoming ions. In other words, what is happening here is ionization. Ionization of a covalent bond. And by the way, let's clarify what that word means. If I take sodium chloride and dissolve it in water, the sodium chloride is not ionizing, it's already ionized. That's the dissociation of ions. If I take something which is covalent and break the bond apart, that's ionization. So I'm making ions. Let's think about solvent properties that we've talked about and how they matter. We've talked about polarity. <clears throat> how would polarity help this reaction? Do we want something which is highly polar or not so polar? Hint, what are we doing? We're taking things which probably have no charge and we're making ions. We're taking things which are, don't have charge and making things which do have charge. What do you think I want? Highly polar, that's right. I want high dielectric constant. The higher, the better, usually. What is dielectric constant? Remember how we defined that? It's ability to separate ions. Ability to insulate, physicists will tell you it's the ability to insulate opposite charges from each other. Same thing, ability to separate ions. We're ionizing, so we want a more polar solvent, as polar as possible. What about proticity? Protic or aprotic? Now it turns out that this isn't nearly as important for SN1 reactions as it is for SN2, but protic does help. So this is either, but protic is generally a little bit better. Now the reason it's a little bit better is because oftentimes that leaving group is leaving with a negative charge, or even if it's neutral in either case, it's still something that hydrogen bonding will help stabilize, so that can help a little bit. So what this means is for SN1 reactions, we're often going to see solvents like water, methanol, ethanol, that kind of thing. Now, as soon as you look at these guys, these solvents, let's say water, for example, or methanol, or ethanol, you might say, there's a potential problem here. And that is competition with some other nucleophile. Let me give you a way to think about that. Imagine this reaction that I just wrote over here. So this one we were talking about, not going to bother with stereochemistry. Imagine we use methanol as the solvent, and we were trying to use, let's say, Cl- as the nucleophile, the argument being that we were trying to make this particular molecule by an SM1 mechanism. So what we want to do is form the carbocation and have the carbocation capture Cl minus. Perfectly reasonable, but this guy is going to get in the way. And the reason for that is not because it's a better nucleophile. As a matter of fact, chloride is a better nucleophile than water, or methanol, excuse me, because of the negative charge. 
The issue here is a matter simply of how many there are. When methanol is the solvent, that means in that reaction, how many methanol molecules are there? A couple? A lot? A lot. It's the solvent. There might be a thousand times, a million times as much methanol as there is other stuff. So when this carbocation forms, there's our carbocation. If it captures chloride, it goes there. If it captures methanol, then there's the deprotonation step. Then it makes the ether that we just did in our previous example. This guy ends up being the major product. And that is, comes out of the fact that carbocations are what and not what? Desperate and not fussy, that's right. It basically means this carbocation is wandering around looking to fill its open octet. It doesn't really care what the source of the electrons is. The first thing it bangs into that's got a pair of electrons, it says, you'll do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here's a metaphor and, well, let's see if it works. My cats are, like to eat 24-7. So they're desperate, which means they're not fussy. They'll eat anything they find lying on the floor. Ew is right. <laughs> Sometimes I catch Mickey, who is our big dumb orange cat, wandering around with a mouthful of just fuzz. I don't know what it is, but he's picked it up and he looks like he's trying to eat it. Now I can't believe that he's that desperate. Maybe he is. I don't know. <clears throat> Anyways, this carbocation is wandering around looking for chloride ion, but it's also in this sea of methanol. The first thing it bangs into is methanol, because there's much more methanol than there is chloride ion. So it goes, hey, methanol, I got an open octet, got a positive charge. You got electrons. Let's make a bond. And that's what they do. So this ends up being the major product, even though we have chloride in there, even though we want the chloride to be. So what happens is this is a case where the solvent participates simply because there's so much of it and because carbocations are desperate. You will see this very frequently in SN1 reactions that the solvent actually participates in the reaction. And we, when that happens, we call this solvolysis. Like hydrolysis, where water is involved, this is solvent lysis. So that happens fairly frequently. <clears throat> All right. Now, we've talked about the kind of variables, the kind of things we explore with SN2. We talked about stereochemistry, and nucleophile, and leaving group, and nature of things attached to the carbon, and nature of the solvents. The next thing we did in SN2 that we can certainly do here is to talk about the, the checklist. If I write an SN1 reaction, how do I know that it's going to proceed at a reasonable rate? Well, let's use this as our example. I'm just going to put it over here. Like the SN2 checklist, the SN1 checklist is basically just a list of the variables and what we really need to have to make the reaction uh, proceed at a reasonable rate. And it's also kind of a function of making that rate determining step energetically as cheap as possible. So what kinds of things, well, what were our variables that we talked about? We talked about nucleophile. We talked about leaving group talked about the things attached to the carbon, and we talked about the solid. All right, let's start at the top of our list, nucleophile. To have a good SN1 reaction, what, can we, what do we need for the nucleophile to be? That's right, nucleophile, irrelevant, scratch it off the list. Do you see nucleophile involved in the rate determining step? No, it's the ionization of the carbon leaving group bond. Nucleophiles aren't involved. Irrelevant. Good nucleophiles, bad nucleophiles, doesn't matter. Leaving group. What can we say about the leaving group? Well, the leaving group's definitely involved. It's the carbon leaving group bond that's ionizing in the rate determining step. So, in terms of leaving group for our reaction to proceed at a reasonable rate, what do you think we need to have? Yeah, it needs to be moderate or better. The same statement that we made for SN2, and for exactly the same reasons. What about 
the nature of the things attached to the carbon. Now really, let's rephrase this because it's not so much, the, uh, let's just rephrase it a little bit different. Here really what we're talking about is the carbocation stability that's involved. It's not how many R groups there are, it's not what the nature of the R groups are really, it's, it's how they make the carbocation stable or not. Turns out for this, we can't have methyl, primary, genuinely not. So we're going to say not methyl, certainly. Primary is discouraged. Doesn't mean it can't happen, especially if there's resonance involved. But it is uncommon. If you're going to do an SM1 reaction involving a primary carbocation, you better have a gosh darn good reason to do it. Secondary, tertiary, knock your socks off. Do those all year or whatever. If you're not wearing socks, then, you know, whatever it is. But no? Okay. Better than primary, just fine. We can do those all we want. What about the solvent? We just, we just stated that we want high dielectric constant. We want polar. That's absolutely necessary. The more polar, the higher the dielectric constant, better. Uh, protic is preferred, but doesn't necessarily have to, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be protic. You'll sometimes see SM1 reactions and things like DMF, but not too often. Now, this list of things is interactive. All three of these variables work together. For example, if you don't have such a great leaving group, you might be able to get away with your SM1 reaction anyways if you have a really nicely stable carbocation and if you have a really polar solvent. Or if your carbocation isn't so good, let's suppose it's primary, then if you have a really wonderful leaving group like triflate and a really polar solvent like water, it might happen. If you don't have a great solvent, less polarity, then maybe if you have a nicely stable carbocation and a really good leaving group, maybe it will happen. But those guys uh, work together as a team to make this happen. One last question we need to answer before we move away from substitution reactions. And that is this. You may have come to the conclusion by now that SN1 and SN2 are alternate ways of achieving exactly the same goal. Metaphor. Let us suppose that when class is over today, you have decided to, you have to go to Sherman Oaks to visit your friend, but you've never been there before. So because it's your friend's house, you call up your friend and say, how do I get there? And your friend can say, well, you can take the 405 or you can take Sepulveda. Or you can go downtown, pick up the 101, and come around that way if you really are insane. But there are alternate ways to get there. They all get you to the same place. They get you to your friend's house. So which one do you pick? I'm sorry? Sepulveda, so you sure? At this time of day? Uh, 405 might not be too bad, but in a couple hours, they'll all be ugly. Then you say to your friend, I'm not coming up there, too much traffic. So the point is, in, in terms of ionic substitution, we have multiple pathways, SM1 and SN2, to get to the same goal, replace the leaving group by nucleophile. How do we know which one to pick? Sometimes it looks like SN2 is good. Sometimes it looks like SM1 is good. So let's answer that question. SN2 versus SN1, which one do I pick? Let's go back to the metaphor. You picked Sepulveda Boulevard. Why did you pick Sepulveda Boulevard? Because 405 is bad. Because the 405 is bad. You mean like the 405 has got bad morals? It's got bad upbringing? It steals, steals candy from babies? Yeah. What do you mean by bad? Slow. slow. It frustrates you. It's less comfortable, right? If you're a molecule and you're slow and frustrated and uncomfortable, that means more energy, right? That's how molecules express that. So in terms of reactions, how do you differentiate between these two? Let me give you another metaphor that might work a little better. This is one of those famous top, one of the top ten ones here. <laughs> this is you. I know we've, just, and we've discussed this one in group meet, in our TA meetings, but this is you. Obviously, you've been on a diet. <laughs> You're in a valley. Big hill, little hill. Now, you have to get out of this valley. Why do you have to get out of this valley? Let us suppose well, 
You're being chased by a tiger. That is a tiger. That's why you have to get out of the valley. Because when I do this metaphor without the tiger, people say, no, I just want to stay where I am. So we have to give you an incentive to leave. In other words, you're desperate to get out of this valley because the tiger is chasing you. Very hungry tiger. Now, to get out of that valley, you have to climb one of those hills. That's, you have no choice in that issue. You've got to climb a hill to get out. So like most people, if you have to climb the hill, you're going to go, uh, I have to climb a hill. I mean, you can hear that at the end of class someday, people will say, I don't want to leave CS50. I have to walk out the steps. I'm just going to sit here and see whatever the next class is. No? OK. But you've got to climb one of these hills. Are you going to climb the big hill or the little hill? Remember, the tiger is going to eat you if you don't climb one of those two hills, big hill or little hill. Little hill. Why? Because you are lazy. You do things the easy way. Unless you're one of those people who gets up and jogs 10 miles at 4 a.m. and you say, oh, no, the big hill because it's more of a challenge. But molecules don't like the challenge. Molecules are mother nature. And if there's one, mother nature is many things, beautiful, complex. But if there's one thing that mother nature also is, is lazy. She does things the easy way. It may not seem that way. Within her rules, she does things the easy way. So this, if this is a molecule and it's got to climb out of this hill, it's got to climb over a transition state, it's going to try that lowest energy transition state. It's going to try this pathway. So the question that we're asking here then is, in terms of the rate determining steps for these two pathways, SN2 and SN1, which is lower? Well, generally speaking, how do we differentiate between them? SN2 is a concerted reaction. Bond make, not always, most of the time. Bond making, bond breaking occurs at the same time. So you're gaining a bond and losing a bond. SN1, on the other hand, you're throwing away a bond, making the carbocation, not gaining that bond back, at least not in the rate determining step. So in general, if we wanted to compare the energy, make a very broad step energy of RDS, SN2 less than SN1. And so therefore, Mother Nature tries SN2 first. If the SN2 conditions are reasonably met, reasonably good nucleophile, reasonably good leaving group, appropriate solvent, carbon bearing the leaving group, not tertiary, remember SN2 checklist, if, if the SN2 conditions are reasonably met, then the reaction most probably goes by an SN2 pathway. But if for some reason SN2 can't occur, then we look at SN1. Now, sometimes SN1 can't occur either. Like if fluoride is the leaving group, then you shut down both pathways. Then the tiger eats you because you can't do either. Now, you might conclude from this that, oh, then we always look at SN2. Why are we? Because SN2, non carbocation, is going to be lower energy than carbocation. So, why are we even bothered talking about SN1? Does SN1, should, SN1 should never occur, it should just be a theoretical construct. Well, no, it does occur. It occurs plenty of times. It's just circumstances where the SN2 energy hill is bigger than the SN1 energy hill. You just have to look at all of the variables that are involved, kind of analyze all of them and say which looks energetically better. Most of the time, SN2 is where we're going to start. All right, now at this point, what we're going to do is switch to completely different gears here. We're going to talk about uh, elimination reactions. So that's in our lecture supplement. your toes. I think we'll use the, try the overhead today instead of the document camera, see how that works. good for you? All right. So up to this point, we have talked about only one functional group change, essentially, and that is an sp3 carbon with a leaving group being converted to an sp3 carbon with something new. Now we're going to talk about a whole separate class of reactions. These are elimination reactions. 
These are ones by our definition here in which a molecule loses atoms or groups of atoms, usually from atoms, from adjacent atoms most of the time. There are rare exceptions to that, but usually on adjacent atoms and the result is a new pi bond. So here's an example, a leaving group uh, is, is, goes away, a hydrogen goes away, and the net effect is that we install a new carbon-carbon pi bond between the carbon that had the hydrogen and the carbon that had the leaving group. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a hydrogen. There are other possibilities as well. But we're going to focus almost exclusively on cases where it's a hydrogen and a leaving group. And the relationship between these guys uh, is, is a beta relationship, which is why we call this beta elimination. And the reason it's beta is because we can label the carbons depending upon their position relative to some group of interest. So usually for this, we label them relative to where the leaving group is. The carbon that bears the leaving group is the alpha carbon. And so the carbon, the next carbon is the beta hydrogen that happens to have, excuse me, the next carbon is the beta carbon, the next one over, and, and it has a hydrogen. We call that the beta hydrogen. And if we went further out, then the next one would be the gamma carbon and the delta carbon and so on and so forth, all the way out as far as you care to go with your Greek alphabet. Now, this kind of reaction where we take away, am I feeding back? Do I need to turn down a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I know how to turn it down. Am I feeding back? Oh, I think I am. That'll take the edge off it. All right. So in most cases, this is going to result in the formation of a new carbon-carbon pi bond. And so this is a great way to make alkenes, alkynes, uh, other kinds of pi bond functional groups. It's not limited, by the way, to alkenes and alkynes. You can make carbonyls and so forth, but most commonly alkenes and alkynes. Now we're going to be making different kinds of alkenes in here. So one of the, there is a nomenclature issue that we have to address. We're not going to talk all about naming alkenes. We, we do need to talk about stereochemistry at the alkene. And that's because it comes in uh, two different flavors. We can have the, if, if the alkene has just carbon groups on one carbon group and one carbon group, and if those two carbon groups are facing in the same direction, like a C, then we call that cis, because they're in the same direction. Like your sister is on the same side of the family as you, in principle. No? Okay. Maybe your sister isn't on the same side of the family. I don't know. On the other hand, if the carbon chain uh, be, goes on the opposite side, so as the carbon chain, as you, here's your carbon chain, as you move through the alkene, it goes to the other side of the alkene, we call that trans. And the way you can remember that is to take something to the other side of town, you have to transport it. Or you can just remember cis and trans. Now the problem with this system is it's great when the alkene has two carbon groups on it, two methyls, a methyl and an ethyl, whatever. But if there are three carbon groups on it, or four carbon groups, or only one carbon group, but something else, say a chlorine, the system doesn't work very well. So cis and trans nomenclature is useful for very simple molecules, but it tends to be in many cases ambiguous. So instead, we have a different stereoisomer. And by the way, these are stereoisomers. There's a different stereoisomer nomenclature that covers all cases and it uses the kahn ingold prelog priorities. It's called the E and Z system. Remember kahn ingold and Prelog. Those are the guys who determine the priorities and establish the rules for R and S. So the way you do this is you take an alkene, and it doesn't matter how many things are attached to it, one, two, three, four things attached, and you take that alkene and you chop it in the middle. So we're going to look at the two sp2 carbons of the alkene separately from each other. On one carbon, you look at the two groups that are attached, assign, figure out which one is the highest priority. Then you go to the other carbon, look at the groups attached to that carbon, figure out which one's the highest priority. If the two highest priority groups are on the same side, pointing in the same direction, up, down, to the left, however you've drawn your alkene, if the two highest priority groups are on the same side, uh, we call that Z isomer. That comes from the German word zusammen, which means together, partly because uh, Prelog was a Hungarian and decided they should use German words for this for whatever reasons. On the other hand, if the two highest priority groups, so here we have the highest priority groups on the same side. If the highest priority groups are on the opposite sides of the alkene, then we call it E. That means entgegen, which is for opposite. The advantage to the kahn engel prelog ez system is that it works for any alkene. Matter of fact, it works for any double bond. It doesn't even have to be an alkene. You can use carbon-nitrogen double bond if you like. Because it doesn't depend on just having carbon groups. It simply depends on the kahn ingold prelog priority. 
So the EZ system is, is never ambiguous. It can always be applied. Cis and trans works on simple cases, but is often ambiguous. So uh, on simple cases, feel free to e e e use either, but I often use E and Z. Now, let's talk about elimination reaction. So here is a typical elimination reaction. We have cyclohexyl chloride, so there's our leaving group. There's our hydrogen, which is beta. Remember, we needed to have leaving group, carbon, carbon, hydrogen relationship. Leaving group, carbon, carbon, hydrogen. And this molecule, by the way, has four hydrogens that are beta to the leaving group. Any of the two hydrogens that are on the uh, two o'clock carbon up here, or any of the two hydrogens that are on the six o'clock carbon, they get you to exactly the same place. They'll get you to cyclohexene. And then we need a base, because bases take away hydrogens. We need to take away a hydrogen. As it turns out, to do an elimination reaction by this mechanism, we need a strong base. And uh, alkoxides, alkyl group O minus bases, are by far the most commonly used versions for this. So here we have methoxide, which is methanol oxide, CH3OH becomes CH3O minus. That's the typical kind of base we might use. We might use hydroxide, HO minus. We might use ethoxide, CH3, CH2O minus. But a lot of times it's an RO minus kind of base. Now for convenience, we often end up using a solvent, which is the conjugate acid of that base. In other words, if the base is RO minus, we often use ROH as the solvent. That, for the most part, is simply a matter of laboratory convenience. Now you might say, didn't you just say that you have to use a strong base? Shouldn't hydrogen bonding reduce basicity in the same way that it reduces nucleophilicity? It is true that hydrogen bonding does reduce basicity, but even in these protic solvent conditions, methoxide is still a good enough base to get this job done. All right, so here's the elimination product. We've made our new pi bond. The methoxide now has the proton, and then there's my leaving group after it's left. And you don't have to draw this stuff. I'm just drawing it for the sake of completeness. What's the mechanism? Now, if you had to make a guess at the mechanism, if you had absolutely no clue, and you didn't have a lab, you know, you were stranded on a desert island, and you didn't have the professor in Gilligan with you, so you didn't have a laboratory made of coconuts, and you didn't have your think book or anything with you or the internet, Pretty bleak place, I'm guessing. But if you were stranded on this desert island, you have nothing but a pad of paper and a pencil, and you are, for some reason, forced to think about the mechanism for this reaction, <laughs> probably because you're saying, I'm waiting for someone to come and rescue me, but I have a final in a week, so I might as well think about organic. Besides, you might say, I haven't studied today. Being, being stranded on a desert island, no, that's not an excuse to not study. I mean, I bet you you'd check Twitter if you were stranded on a desert island and had an internet connection, right? All right, anyways, back to the subject. Um, when you're thinking about a mechanism, you're making a first guess at the mechanism and not having really any clues otherwise, assuming that the mechanism is concerted is a reasonable place to start. It doesn't mean that all mechanisms are concerted. It's just a good first guess until you have other pieces of information which clearly say that it's not like they're, you're trying to do substitution at a tertiary carbon or something like that. So as a first guess, let's just assume everything happens at the same time. Base takes hydrogen, leaving group leaves, and at the same time, the pair of electrons, which used to be the CH bond, are gonna come in and make the pi bond. If we didn't have that, simul if we didn't have that CH bond electrons becoming the pi bond, at the same time the leaving group is leaving, we'd get a carbocation. And we know that's expensive, so here we can avoid it. Now that's a guess at the mechanism. So you might go into the laboratory and test it. Obviously, you can't do that if you're on the deserted island, but you don't like that metaphor, do you? No, I do. You do? Okay. Would you rather be the, like Skipper or Gilligan or which one of you? No preference. So you'd be Marianne? <laughs> yeah, they're all good, right? I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Do you even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no? Okay. That's good. Yeah, we can, you can discuss it on the discussion board. Ask, ask about Gilligan's Island. Someone talked about the Goldilocks. Somebody, that's right. Somebody put up a link to Goldilocks on the discussion board. All right, anyway. So if this is our assumed mechanism, what are the kinetics? Everything's happening at the same time. So the, the reaction involves one molecule of the thing that's being eliminated, the thing with that leaving group, plus one molecule of base. So there's our rate expression. It says that we're predicting the rate is going to be bimolecular, and it's going to be very much like SN2 kinetics. 
So if we double the amount of, we double the concentration of base, the rate should double. If we cut the concentration of the cyclohexyl chloride by a tenth, then the rate should be a tenth, et cetera. Mechanism uh, test. So if we go into the laboratory and do that, sure enough, it turns out that is indeed what the rate expression is. Now, and, and so that supports the mechanism, but it doesn't prove the mechanism. We can draw alternate mechanisms with rate determining steps that might have the same kinetics. But there's a huge number of other bits of data which all point to this mechanism. So this is the one we're going to accept for this case where we've got that good base. So we're going to give it a name just like we named SN2 and SN1. This is elimination reaction, making the new pi bond, and it is bimolecular, two molecules in the rate expression, so we call it E2. All right, so this is fine and dandy. We have a mechanism for this process and a name. But one way in which this is simplistic, this particular example is simplistic, in that only one alkene can be formed. Sure, we can draw the double bond in different positions. We can draw the double bond between the two and the four o'clock carbons. Or if we take away the six o'clock hydrogens, then we get the double bond between the six o'clock and the four o'clock carbons. But it's exactly the same molecule. It's just drawn from a different perspective. Only one product possible. There are plenty of E2 reactions where multiple products are possible, and we would like to be able to predict which one of these is the major one. Here's an example. 2-bromobutane. In this case, we're going to use hydroxide as the strong base. So we have a possibility of taking a hydrogen away, beta hydrogens over here on the end, on carbon number one. That leads to, leads to one butene. Or we can take away the beta hydrogens on carbon number three, and depending upon the alkene, we can either get E or Z2 butene. So three products potentially can be formed. Now, if we go into the laboratory and actually do this, there's 19% of one butene is formed, and an 81% 80, total mixture of the, in the E and Z2 butene is called. This guy with the alkene on the end of the chain is called the terminal alkene, and if the alkene is somewhere other than the end of the chain, it's called internal. That doesn't, here it happens to be right in the middle, but it doesn't have to be right in the middle. Internal simply means not on the end. Now, the fact that when you do this reaction, the major products have the alkene uh, internal and not terminal was first noted a long time ago by a Russian named Zaitsev. And this became known as Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev said, basically, the major product of what we would now recognize as an E2 reaction is the more highly substituted alkene. In other words, the alkene that has more carbons directly bonded to it is the major one. Now, that's an empirical observation. We'd like to know a little bit about where it comes from. And we might also actually ask the question, why should we care? There used to be probably two old view guys remember. There was a radio comedy group called Fire Science Theater, and they had their own version of kind of CSI. And so the the uh, police detective would always go to talk to Dr. Si or Mr. Science was the guy's name. So he would explain scientific things, all right? It's like on CSI when they go into the laboratory and somebody explains simple science to somebody else. So Mr. Science would explain something scientific to Nick Danger was the detective's name. And at the end, there was always these little kids asking questions. And at the end of Dr. Science's or Mr. Science's explanation, the kids would go, so what, Mr. Science? Who cares, Mr. Science? Big deal, Mr. Science. So that's the whole point, right? Why should we care? Well, the reason we should care is a couple of reasons. Number one, we learned fundamental ideas about how organic reactions operate. We, do this, we made the same argument in the beginning of SN2. By understanding these kinds of things, it makes it easier to think about other kinds of reactions. What we learn here applies in other cases. Number two, outside of theoretical constructs, there are practical constructs. Imagine you work for a company. I know this is a little, kind of a stupid example. Imagine you work for a company and your job is to take 2-bromobutane and make alkenes out of it. And if the product your company wants is these guys, that's fine. But what if the product your company wants is 1-butene? How do you change the reaction to favor 1-butene? Well, you have to know about the mechanism and what controls it, etc. Now, that's a simple version, but there's plenty of those kinds of ideas out there. So what we would like to do is to understand what the origin of this major product is. Now, we can think about two, two kinds of ideas that control which product is major. The first one we're going to talk about is a circumstance where the product ratio is controlled by the rate in which they are made. Metaphor which I have to replace because it's not a good metaphor anymore. 
back in the days when the bomb shelter was open, how many of you mourn the loss of the bomb shelter? How many of you would much prefer to eat at Carl's Jr.? You're kidding, all right. <laughs> Anyways, we, bomb shelter, Carl's, whatever you'd like to do. Imagine there are two people standing behind the counter making sandwiches or hamburgers or, you know, Big Carl, whatever the heck they call it, Big Grease Burger or whatever it is. Anyway, so if you have two people making sandwiches, but there's only one stack of bread and one stack of meat, but they're making different kinds of sandwiches. Whoever makes sandwiches faster will make more sandwiches by the time all of the bread and meat is used up. Whoever makes the sandwiches faster makes more sandwiches. If somebody makes sandwiches twice as fast, you know, two, one sandwich every 30 seconds as opposed to one sandwich every minute at the end when the supplies run out, there will be twice as many sandwiches from the person who can make them once every 30 seconds than the person who can make them once every 60 seconds. So in a reaction, if we have two pathways, whichever is faster produces more product. That's called kinetic control. The Amount, the product ratio is simply controlled by the rate of the two pathways. Now, there's also a circumstance where the reaction mechanism allows the products to interconvert. In other words, if you make products A and B, and then something in the reaction allows A and B to interconvert between the two of them. So A and B are in equilibrium. In that case, it doesn't matter how quickly A or B is made. When the reaction is at equilibrium, it simply depends on the relative stability of A and B. That's called thermodynamic control. That is the equivalent of if at the end, when you've got that two stacks of sandwiches, if you're allowed to take apart the sandwiches and put them back and take them apart and put them back and reassemble them, et cetera, until somebody says, okay, I like the fact that there are twice as many of these than there are these. It doesn't matter that these were made faster. I just happen to like these more. That's thermodynamic control, where you get to rearrange things at the end. Both of these are possibilities when it comes to figuring out rate at which products are produced. So let's talk about kinetic control first. I know this is kind of a convoluted argument, but the kinds of ideas that we're going to come out of this, we're going to come out with one, we won't get to it today, but one very important idea overall about picking products in many, many reactions. So here's how the kinetic process works. So imagine we have two reactants, A and B, and if or reactants, excuse me, that make A and B. So these two pathways have their own energies of activation, A and B, for their rate determining step or their one step, whatever they are. If pathway A has a lower energy of activation, that means pathway A is faster. The reactants, more reactants are consumed following pathway A than pathway B. So that means A is the major product, product which is produced faster is the major one. This is kinetic control. How might that matter in our E2 reaction? Well, in our E2 reaction, we look at, since it's a single step mechanism, it's concerted in this case, everything happens at once. We want to compare, compare rates, which means we want to look at energies of activation. The reactants are the same, it's the transition states that are different, kind of. So let's look at that. We have one, two, three transition states leading to the three different products. So here's the transition state that leads to the terminal alkene. Let's look at this guy first. There is the base taking the hydrogen. There's the pi bond being formed. There's the leaving group leaving. There's the transition state. It's got a delta plus on the base and a delta plus on the leaving group and that pi bond beginning to grow in. Now, all of our transition states have that feature, delta minuses and pi bonds growing in. But one way in which our transition states are different can be seen by looking at a Newman projection. So we're looking along this bond, the CH3 that's being deprotonated, that's in front, and the carbon with the leaving groups in the back. One difference between these three transition states is how crowded they are, how many bad interactions there are. So here we have the transition state that leads to the terminal alkene. And in terms of bad interactions, well, if we're talking about bad interactions, we mean things that are worse than being gauche with a hydrogen. Remember, remember gauche, 60 degree angle, right? Or not, not, uh, not eclipse. So here we have Hydrogen to hydrogen, that's fine. Hydrogen to hydrogen is fine. Hydrogen to bromine is fine. Bromine to hydrogen, hydrogen to ethyl, ethyl to hydrogen. No bad interactions. Everything is next to a hydrogen. That's about as good as you can get. Now, why this particular arrangement? Why is the CH bond that's being broken uh, coplanar with, but on the opposite side as the carbon leaving group bond? We call that anti-periplanar arrangement. 
There's a particular reason for that. It is true that the transition state is the highest energy point along that particular mechanism step, but it doesn't mean that it has to be the most energetically expensive structure that you can conceive of. Mother Nature still does things the lazy way. There are multiple transition state possibilities, but Mother Nature picks the lowest one. Remember climbing out of the valley when you're being chased by the tiger? Here there's no tiger. You're not, there's no desperateness to this one, but you're still coming out of the valley, so you're still going to take the lowest pathway. And that lowest pathway in terms of the transition state means you still have to pay some energy price because there's bonds being broken and so forth, but you still want to do it the easiest way which means you want to minimize the bond loss and maximize the bonds that you're gaining. And one way you can do that is by making sure that the atoms are in a position to allow that carbon-carbon pi bond to form. And this is going to have some uh, constraints on the transition state because for the pi bond to form, the p orbitals which make it need to be parallel. And very close to parallel. A few degrees off is fine, but they have to be parallel. Now, where are those p orbitals coming from? If you follow the carbons through the transition state, the carbon that used to have the hydrogen that's being removed by the base, that carbon's going from sp3 to sp2. So in the transition state, that CH bond is beginning to grow in. There's a little baby p orbital beginning to grow in there. Where the leaving group is, that's also that bond there and there, p orbital beginning to grow in there. So the two carbons are going from sp3 to sp2, p orbitals are growing in. We want those p orbitals that are growing in to be parallel in the transition state because as they're growing in, they can overlap and make that pi bond. If the geometry of the transition state was different, it, let's suppose the CH bond that was being broken and the carbon bromine bond which were being broken were gauche. So the two p orbitals that are growing in would end up being gauche and you wouldn't have that extra pi bond being formed. One less bond, less stability. So this transition state has a, a geometry requirement that those two p orbitals be lining up, and that forces the CH bond that's being broken and the carbon leaving group bond that are being broken to be parallel. Now most of the time they're going to be parallel pointing in the opposite direction because that comes from a staggered conformation. You can put the carbon leaving group and the carbon hydrogen bond eclipsed and still do the E2 reaction, but that's energetically more expensive because things are eclipsed. So we want to have this periplanar arrangement, preferably anti, but it has to be a periplanar arrangement of the CH and C, in this case, carbon bromine bonds. All right, so we have that in all three transition states, and we can get back to the, the uh, crowding argument. So in this first transition state, no bad interactions, zero. In this second transition state, this is one that leads to uh, uh, trans 2 butene. So here's the arrangement. You can work out with the models. I encourage you to do that, see how that leads to this geometry. If we want to make the analysis here, we find only one, we find one bad interaction, uh, something other than hydrogen, something gauche. It's that bromine methyl, so there's one gauche interaction. If we make the analysis for the transition state that leads to the Z 2 butene, and again, I encourage you to play with the models and see where that comes from. We have the methyl-methyl gauche interaction and we have the methyl-bromine gauche interaction. So we have two gauche interactions. Since everything else is pretty much the same, we're making essentially the same bond changes in each transition state. We can analyze their stability based on the torsional strain issue. In the order that they're listed, there is increasing torsional strain. Transition state leading to one butene, essentially none. Transition state leading to um, E2 butene has one bad interaction. Z2 butene transition state has two interactions. So if we were to rank these in terms of energetically expensiveness, increasing energy of activation, lowest, middle, highest. And so that suggests, we're just, we're, hold on a second, we're almost done here for today. That suggests the following order. It says that one butene, since it has the lowest energy of activation, should be formed in the greatest amount fastest, followed by E2 butene, followed by Z2 butene. We should get the least amount of that. That's the prediction. It turns out the theory doesn't agree with that. There must be something else operating. So here's what I want you to think about. Think about the thermodynamic control argument. Think about the alkene stability issue, which is laid out here, and see how that prediction works. And that is where we're going to pick up on Wednesday.